Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're healthy and safe. Uh, I'm Aaron David Miller, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, and welcome back after a short break in August to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual discussions on critical issues of real importance to America and to the world. Our last session on the US and Africa featured Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Linda, Linda Thomas Greenfield. It was a very exciting and we're looking forward to a rich and exciting agenda this fall, beginning with today's discussion. Does foreign policy matter in a presidential election year or given the uh, proximity of what's going to happen in several hours to a debate? Should foreign policy matter? Will it matter? Or will this debate be so unconventional, so idiosyncratic, so loaded with hot button issues from the Supreme Court to tax returns to pandemic, that there'll be little room for a serious discussion either of foreign policy issues or domestic issues. That remains to be seen. But clearly back in the day, foreign policy matters a lot more than it does now. The Republican landslide in 1920 was a direct result of the uncertainties and challenges in the wake of the First World War. FDR broke the two-term precedent in 1940 and 1944 uh, and, and gained enormous legitimacy in response to impending war and war as well. In 1952, Korea was the dominant issue in the Stevenson-Ike issue. In 68, LBJ was literally driven from the White House as a consequence of Vietnam, although the Humphrey Nixon election of Vietnam did not did not play a, uh, a, a singular role. And of course, 1980, uh, you have the Iranian hostage crisis in Afghanistan. Increasingly though, after the Cold War, it seems that foreign policy has more or less dropped out of the um, uh, presidential elect electoral cycle and the debates. You had the Iraq war in 04 and 08 and it figured prominently in 9-11. But in August 20, uh, just last month, Pew poll of registered voters on 12 issues that Americans said, said were very important to them. The economy polled in at 79%, healthcare at 68%, Supreme Court appointments at 64%, COVID-62, violent crime 59, then foreign policy at 57 with climate and the abortion issue, interestingly enough, coming up at 42 and 40% 40 uh, respectively. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that um, like so many other issues confronting the Republic today, uh, we are a divided nation when we weren't as much nearly so on foreign policy. So there's a lot to get through uh, today. And um, we have uh, a number of questions that I'd like to pose um, before we start. Is foreign policy doomed to be a peripheral issue most of the time in, shading voter, in shaping voter preferences? And is the lack of attention to foreign policy a result of a public that's either indifferent not well versed in national security or to quote Tip O'Neill, simply flows from the fact that all politics are local. What would it take to get Americans focused in an election year uh, on events beyond the country's borders? And of course, how will the issue of national security and foreign policy play in the debates and in this election? It is not specifically on Chris Wallace's agenda tonight, although the issue of Biden and Trump's record is on the agenda and, and it may and it may well come up. And finally, might any foreign policy issue prove consequential as we move toward November 3rd? I'm glad I don't have to answer any of these questions, uh, but to answer them and to unpack them, we have three, we have an all-star panel. All of them are well known to you. Abbreviated bios should suffice. Amanda Carpenter is a political columnist for The Bulwark, a regular CNN contributor and author of Gaslighting America, quote, why we love it when Trump lies to us. Previously, she served as a speechwriter to South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint and a communications director to Ted Cruz. Charlie Cook is the editor and publisher of the Cook Political Report and a political analyst for the National Journal Group. Charlie's also a political analyst for NBC News. 
Jen Psaki was the White House communications director in uh, former President Barack Obama's administration from 2015 to 2017, and spokesperson at the Department of State under then Secretary of State John Kerry from 2013 to 2015. And above all, I hope she doesn't mind, she's probably the mother of two humans under the age of five, which I think is <laughs> one of the most extraordinary identifications I've heard in a bio. So format, each will speak for roughly five minutes, a moderated uh, uh, round with me of annoying questions for about 20, and then Q&A with, um, with our Twitterverse email and whoever else is listening. So Jen, without further ado, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Aaron and Charlie and Amanda. It's great to join you for this panel. I'm sure I'll learn a lot from both of you. Um, well, you had, you had a lot of questions in there to unpack, um, but it made me think about um, back in 2007 and 8 when I was working for then Senator Barack Obama. And as Charlie and Amanda and probably you too, Aaron, will remember, you know, part of the reason why he became a nominee was because of his opposition to the Iraq war. Uh, very much a foreign policy issue that was central in that presidential race and was central for in a different way in 2004 when I worked for John Kerry. But um, at, by the end of the campaign, he won the election in part because of the financial crisis and because he presented, um, you know, an option to the American people of somebody who they felt would be fighting for them. And I use that example because it may feel like people are starting to vote, of course, across the country. There are lines here in Virginia uh, almost every day where I live. But we have a lifetime before the actual election happens, even though people are voting. And all sorts of things can happen. So I say that because um, foreign policy, as we all know, is a um, fickle, fickle guy or gal. Um, and events can happen that may impact how voters think. Um, the later it is, the closer it is to November 3rd. Uh, obviously, many people have voted before then. But I think it's important to uh, keep that in mind. Um, I, I think some of the polling you added there, Aaron, is really important to touch on. Um, and Charlie obviously follows this very closely, and, and I'm sure he'll have some interesting ads to make here. But foreign policy is something that Americans say they care about, and I think they do care about. It's just where they care about it in the rank order of things, right? Healthcare and the economy are consistently higher, and that's been the case for some time. It was certainly the case in 2018. I mean, Democrats won back the House in part as a check on Trump but in part because um, people were afraid of having their health care taken away. It didn't mean there weren't, as we all know, many, many international and foreign policy events happening, but it's all about how it, how, how it impacts people. How do you meet people where they are? And I think that is a lesson for a lot of people who are trying to communicate about how important foreign policy issues are and the differences. How are these issues impacting people's daily lives? Um, so I'll take COVID. I don't know how long I've been talking, so I'll stop in a minute or two here because I want to hear what Amanda and Charlie have to say and lots of questions. People don't think of COVID as a foreign policy issue. It is absolutely a foreign policy issue. And when it is done effectively, uh, when Joe Biden is president, I think I can be, uh, you know, um, it will be very much coordinated between the domestic and the uh, national security teams. That's how it should be. And helping solve this crisis in the United States requires a strong foreign policy and national security approach. People don't always see it that way. And it doesn't, you know, when you're sitting at home and you're trying to do Zoom school with your kids or you're trying to figure out when life will go back to normal, people don't think about it that way. But it should be talked about in that way. Um, climate change is a foreign policy issue, very much so. Um, you know, the United States obviously needs to do a lot to get our house in order, but uh, needs to continue to lead on that front in order to address climate change. It's not just about uh, what's happening, um, you know, in our streets and cities here in the United States. That's part of it, but it's very much an international issue. And these are issues that impact people domestically and at home. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say is just that, you know, having served in a White House, um, what people don't always realize or digest is that Foreign policy and national security is one of the ways that any president can operate um, by this, you know, through their own vision of what leadership should be um, and what their own vision of what policy should be in a way that at many times is unchecked um, by Congress, by the public, um, because 
there's so much power that every commander in chief has. Um, so it is an area where um, it should be a focus um, of the public um, because you are you are giving trust over to a president in a way about this scope of issues um, more than more than most others. Um, but I'll stop there. Who's next on the hot Jen. seat, Aaron? <laughs> Jen, thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting is that there is a tendency to think that foreign policy doesn't matter because, as Jen pointed out, it describes and uh, encapsulates so many things. I mean, what is it? Does it mean trade? Does it mean cybersecurity? Does it even mean immigration policy? And I think in a post 9-11 world, voters have basically boiled down foreign policy into thinking, are there bad guys coming to strike American land again and who will stop it? I think it's become solely a national security and terrorism issue in the minds of voters. But, you know, that said, some of our most important political events during the Trump presidency have been firmly in the foreign policy wheelhouse. I mean, let's not forget, he was impeached this year for inappropriate uh, conversations with Ukraine. Um, There's a years long investigation led by Robert Mueller based on inappropriate undisclosed contacts with Russia. And so those are pretty major events in the Trump presidency. And I think we always end up asking, well, will it matter? Will it move uh, Republican voters? What is really interesting to me from my vantage point as a never Trump Republican is that the only times that his supporters on Capitol Hill who are also respondent, uh, responsive to constituents and voters, the only times they have really broken with him have been on foreign policy and election issues. Uh, I think people look past that because there is only one Republican vote against impeachment. But look at the times there's been Senate resolutions led by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to draw a line in the sand. Uh, they had a Senate resolution speaking out after that disastrous Helsinki press conference saying that, um, no, we will not, uh, we must refuse Putin's suggestion that we'll extradite uh, US soldiers they could have gone further. They should have gone further. Senate Democrats pushed that. But that was a significant point in which they said, this is an intolerable line. Um, they've opposed his declaration of emergency to allow for the sale of billions of dollars to Saudi Arabia. He later overrode that Senate veto, but that still was a significant point of foreign policy. The Senate uh, GOP passed a resolution to get that whistleblower complaint in the fall of 2019 from the intelligence community, which did provide the basis for impeachment. And then after he issued the drone strike in Iran to kill the top military commander, there was also legislation to limit his war powers. Um, and then just this summer, Senate Republicans have spoken out um, pretty harshly against him when he talked about possibly delaying the election. And then um, once again, when he was talking about not having a peaceful transition of power. And so for this discussion, and doesn't matter to voters, I think the intersection of foreign policy and elections is incredibly important. Because remember, for this to matter, he only has to lose a small percentage of Republican voters for this to be a landslide for Joe Biden. And so that's extremely interesting. And it's not only contained within you know, voters and on Capitol Hill, the most prominent members of his White House who have left to speak out against him represent the foreign policy community in voices like uh, former Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, former um, Department of Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly, both retired four-star generals, uh, John Bolton, the list goes on from other whistleblowers inside the Department of Homeland Security. And so I do think that does have an effect, even though it gets missed in this broader foreign policy discussion because we don't quite have the language to distill that down to voters. But these are absolutely going to be voter voting issues for people on the fence. You know, Amanda, that's an excellent point. I mean, it almost reaffirms something that I've felt very important for many years, and that is that politics on many issues, critical issues to the image of the nation should in fact stop at the water's edge. And you've pointed out that that's, it's a fascinating construct as a kind of backdoor analysis of why foreign policy actually does matter and could in reshaping voter attitudes and preferences. Fascinating point. Charlie, on to you. Great. Thank you, Aaron. I want to thank you and Bill Burns for the invitation to be on such a prestigious panel with these other folks that are so much smarter and know so much more about this stuff than I do. Uh, so I'm just a political <laughs> hack. but. Um, you know, let me put up a, a slightly different construct. It's not disagreeing at all with anything Amanda said, but that, that to me, 
when you've got two people running for president and neither one's an incumbent, that's a choice election. And sure, partisanship and other things come into play, but that's a choice. But when you have an incumbent president running, it's a referendum. It's do you want to extend this president's contract for another four years? And so that's the fundamental question. And then you say, okay, what feeds into that? Now, sadly, foreign policy, at least directly, because you guys have brought out some ways where, you know, drug policy, immigration, these other trade, these other things, but foreign policy per se, it, it's not, um, I wish Americans thought more about it. I wish, you know, I wish every American read The Economist cover to cover every week and, you know, read foreign policy and foreign affairs and go to watch Carnegie, and, but but that's not not where we're, we're living. Uh, that's not what they, how not a major ingredient when they decide do they want to extend this president's contract uh, or or not? Um, and so I don't think to the extent that it it convinces people that this person is not cut out to be president or this is someone they're proud of or that they would like to continue with, that's 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 where where it comes into play. Um, you know, thinking about uh, you know in terms of foreign policy, in some ways. Um, it, it comes down to a question of are there Americans coming home killed or maimed or not? I mean, that's like the big thing. And it, the threshold for other things influencing um, public opinion uh, in a presidential election is it, pretty limited and it's a pretty esoteric group. But, you know, in a, an election where we've got it's very, very stable, there are very few undecided voters. And um, and this is an election like it always is, is, you know, do you want to renew President Trump's contract for another four years? Yes or no. And he it, it's always like that with an incumbent, but with someone who is as polarizing as he is with 75 percent of Americans either strongly approving or strongly disapproving him. Uh, and, and that was pretty much true before he even took the oath of office. And there's just been very little change. So the odds of something tonight or in the, the next debates related to foreign policy, moving people because they agree or disagree with something said, I think that's really pretty, uh, pretty unlikely. But does it feed into a, is it something that for one of those three, four, five percent, and that's really all we're looking at here, that would tilt some of them towards, um, uh, that would resonate with them? in a special, special way. And um, I'm count me as count me as pretty is pretty skeptical that that's uh, that that's going to happen. Um, so I, I I'm a little uh, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed when I meet with people from foreign governments, foreign, you know, foreign ministries, that sort of thing. I I always sort of have an apologetic thing. And this is precedes President Trump. This is, you know, that Americans, it is like we are an island in the middle of an ocean with nothing else for 10,000 miles away. And I know for people like in Europe, for example, that border lots of countries, they just find this absolutely bizarre, mind boggling. Uh, but only having two borders with Canada and Mexico and, uh, and not being an island, and but being so much larger than our two neighbors in terms of population, uh, it, it's a little inevitable, but but we are, um, we you know, we are pretty self-focused uh, as a country, and so I, I uh, I'm a little skeptical about about how much it would affect unless it just said, this person is who I want to lead us, or this person is absolutely unfit for the job, and anything outside of that paradigm. Uh, on related to foreign policy in these debates or anything else. I mean, I frankly don't think the New York Times story is going to affect. But I mean, President Trump's base is 40, 42 percent. Right. And I don't know which is harder, marble or granite, but those people are not going anywhere. And the 45, 50 percent, <laughs> they're not going anywhere. And the people that are left, the people that are actually in between, I really were, wonder whether they are going to vote anyway, because I don't know how you can't have an opinion. I mean, on this, I mean, this, you know, one way or the other. So um, I, I'm a little, you know, I'll, I'll be the, the, the uh, skunk at the picnic, uh, so to speak, uh, of saying, you know, probably won't. But the other thing is, most, you know, undecided voters, I don't think they watch debates. Are you kidding? Uh, you know, if they paid attention to stuff, they probably would have made an opinion one way or the other by now. So, uh, 
Marty is a skeptic. Yeah, no, it's I take your point. It's grim, but let me let me push all three of you on a point that Jen raised. You know, the organizing principle of any nation's foreign policy and the primary responsibility of a president is to protect the American people and guarantee their security and prosperity. What if, and this is picking up on a point that Jen raised, I ask it as a question to you. You've got the most serious threat to public health since the great influenza of 1917, 1918, which killed 675,000 Americans. You have floods, you have fires that are, are, are affecting the daily lives of Americans. In fact, in theory, this crisis, the pandemic, on paper, if not in practice, theoretically threatens the health and well-being of every single one of us, all 330 million of us. So it's a backdoor approach to the importance of foreign policy since climate is not just an American issue, and it, obviously it's a pandemic, it's a global experience. Could not that have an impact on reshaping voter perceptions in this election? Or isn't the way, or people don't see it that way. I mean, climate in the Pew poll was literally 40%. It was the last issue of the 12th. So what do you think? Jen, you raised that issue because I think it's compelling. I mean, it looks forward to be sure. Yeah, look, I mean, my view on that is that it can impact some pockets, but it's not as sweeping as those of us who may support Joe Biden think it should be, right? Um, you know, it's just like the tax story. I know this is not a, you know, discussion about that, but, you know, that's not, I'm not a believer that's going to massively move the public, even though if you, we read it, it's shocking, right? Um, the tax story of how little Donald Trump paid in taxes. I will say, if you look at COVID as an issue, um, which you mentioned, and it's obviously heavy on the minds of everybody, there are pockets like um, support among seniors for Joe Biden, which is higher than it has been for Democratic candidates in, for president um, in some time. Um, you know, COVID seems to show up in, in the mishandling of COVID as, as a reason for that, right? Um, but across the board, you know, one would think that given where the economy is and the direction of the recession and the fact that millions of people are out of jobs, people, the support for Donald Trump for the economy would have dropped dramatically. It has not, right? Um, and so um, I think it has impacted in some pockets and not others. I, I will say, you know, one of the points Charlie raised about how you know, elections, especially re-elections, are referendums. I mean, even more so now, but certainly when I was working for Barack Obama in 2012, it was too, right? At that point, the economy was not fully recovered, right? But part of our objective and goal was to um, show Mitt Romney as somebody who was not qualified, not, not qualified, but not suited, I should say, to be standing up for uh, people who were still struggling, right? Um, by painting him as somebody who was um, disconnected and, and very wealthy and kind of only of that world. Uh, and also to ask people to give us another, give us more time, right? And, you know, part, that's part of what I think any president does and part of what I think Trump and his team are trying to do on the economy. And they have managed or just, I don't know, by inertia, I have no idea, to keep support for him on the economy at a higher rate than I think most would expect, given what we're looking at. Uh, but I don't think we should underestimate that is a factor, even though I think Joe Biden would win if the election were tomorrow. Amanda, Charlie, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, obviously, when you've got 5% of the world's population and everybody points to the 25% of the cases, but I think far more compelling is 20% of the world's deaths due to the pandemic, um, that's, that's pretty embarrassing. Um, are Americans aware of that? Uh, no, not really. Um, are Americans aware that, are many Americans aware that we were the preeminent leader of the free world for three quarters of a century and now we're not trusted? Um, I think it's shockingly few people that's even crossed their minds or if it has, they don't care. Uh, and so that's, that, I mean, these are the things that get me, that, that get me down. 
right. is it's not what the what is it, it, part of it is what is talked about, but a lot of it's just what's mm -hmm. not talked about, and whether it's you know whether it's the whether it's this or whether it's uh, um, you know we're going to have a national debt that's going to equal our GDP next year, but you know is that a, is that a topic in this debate? No, not really. Um, so I, 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 I kind of get down on this, but to Jen's point, which I, you know, on the, yes, when incumbent is up, it is a referendum up or down on that incumbent. And if that incumbent is, is endangered, and certainly the economy, it was getting better by 2012, but it was, it was doing it real. I mean, it had gone into a really deep ditch and, you know, it was a slow and, so to me, anytime you have an endangered incumbent, the, the, the incumbent's campaign tries to either disqualify the opponent or to change the subject. And in the disqualification, and I think what was so what was unique about President Obama's situation was that because it was the economy that was holding him back and the opponent was a very successful business person, this required a heck of a lot of delicacy. I mean, because he was coming at you in a way that virtually none of the other Republicans could have. Uh, and so it's, it's you try to disqualify or change the subject. And, and uh, with President Trump, it's really well, it's actually they're kind of doing some some mix of both. But ultimately, it's going to be up or down on him. And if you think about it, for the last three and a half years, everything in American politics, everything, has revolved around him for good or bad everything that's happened and and ultimately i think that that thumb up thumb down is is what it's gonna is what it's all about but have we taken a hit around the world oh gosh yeah and and, and a good question is how about this if we elected god as our next president how long would it take god to restore american prestige and position around the world I think it'd take a few years. I, I should, that's not a metaphor I should use, but I, I, I think it's going to take a while to fix uh, where we are in terms of our allies uh, and forget the skeptics, the, the people that say, gosh, these people are incompetent. I mean, they can't, they, you know, they've done worse than a lot of third world countries have in terms of dealing with the pandemic. I want to get to the issue of, of our standing, but just a note to our viewers, if you want to ask a question, I'm reading here, use the live chat feature in YouTube, email us at pressoffice at ceip.org, or tweet at us, uh, hashtag Carnegie Connects. You raised the issue of the, of the incumbent, uh, Charlie, and I, I want to ask a question of the three of you. How, how powerful a card or an advantage is incumbency. We've now had three two-term presidents in a row. The last time we had three two-term presidents in a row, minus the FDR exception, was Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. So I'm kind of thinking that Americans get forgetful, forgiving, they bring all kinds of rationalizations to the vote, at least in modern times. How, how important is the incumbent, either with respect to foreign policy when it comes to an election, or just generally? Mandy, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I would say, well, Donald Trump is going to have foreign policy achievements to brag about. And quite frankly, it surprises me he hasn't done more of that. And if I were giving him advice going into this debate, I would urge him to find ways to highlight that. I mean, the normalization of relations between the Arab states and Israel is a big deal, uh, primarily because it upended the conventional wisdom that you would have to deal with the Israel-Palestinian question first. And they just went straight to you know, these Arab power brokers and got it done. Um, you know, am I uncomfortable with the fact that Jared Kushner is a close buddy, it seems, with MBS? Yes, but that doesn't mean that the Trump administration doesn't have something big to talk about and possibly throw in Joe Biden's face because a lot of the conventional wisdom you can't was that you can't do this. There will be deadly, horrible consequences. This isn't the only achievement he could talk about within this framework. Uh, they also can talk about using the embassy, moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Um, his withdrawal from the Iran Treaty, 
in that lethal strike against uh, Qasem Soleimani. People said bad things were going to happen. That still may come, but he can say, I was right, Joe Biden, you were wrong. And he would be sort of silly not to present that framework. That doesn't mean Joe Biden doesn't have responses to that, but that would be what a healthy foreign policy debate would look like from a president with the powers of incumbency and achievements to talk about. Yeah, it's a very good point. Who's got the better story to tell? Well, there's I, always, I, go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was going to say, there's always a better story to tell on, on, on foreign policy as the incumbent, almost always, right? Um, may, maybe not in the case of Bush in 2004, but he still won re-election because yep. it was reassuring to the public that he would kind of continue to fight against terrorism, right? Um, but, you know, I think to Amanda's point, um, and nobody's calling me from the Trump administration for advice and I'm not offering it, but um, me either. I do think as the benefit of the incumbency and being president is that you have all of the pomp and circumstance of the presidency behind you, right? And that includes your engagement with foreign leaders and your ability to um, be the commander in chief and, um, you know, engage with the military and use all of the incredible uh, resources and assets at the, at the U.S. disposal. I will say that there is one piece that I think many Democrats, including myself, thought would be more powerful, which is like showing that Donald Trump is buddies with dictators and people who have questionable moral high ground, to put it diplomatically. Um, and that's not effective. Um, it's been shown, and I've been watched focus groups and seen polling, showing that Donald Trump is pals with all these dictators and uh, immoral figures around the world. People who support him, and even people who are on the border, think it shows he does things differently and that he he's a strong man who pals around with strong men. Um, and so it doesn't have the um, intended effect um, that I think that many Democrats um, thought it might. Um, and in fact, I think they use it, um, you know, to kind of show that he does things differently and that he's willing to take chances, even if most uh, foreign policy and national security experts from all political stripes will say some of the steps he's taken have been crazy, ill-advised, and put us in a poor position in the world. Yeah, the, disru yeah, I, the disruptor. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, I, I feel a little self-conscious uh, talking about the power of the presidency in front of a former White House communications director, Jen, <laughs> to write a, a PhD dissertation <laughs> in her sleep on, on this. But, you know, there's no question the, the, the presidency is a powerful instrument, and it's got a lot, there are a lot of tools in that toolbox. And that a focused, disciplined president can get in a really deep jam and find ways to get out. But if someone isn't focused and if they aren't disciplined, that's a different story. And I found, I mean, I talked to all kinds of groups and all kinds of people, and people rarely agree about American politics. But I would say the one thing that I could get more people to agree on than anything else, regardless of their party affiliation, regardless of their ideology, is President Trump is often his own worst enemy. That will get heads nodding no matter where you are on the spectrum. And, and that's why, you know, I think as we're sitting here and uh, he's eight to 10 points behind nationally, he's behind in the three states that matter most by five, six points, like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the clock is ticking and more people are voting every moment than and, and earlier, that uh, uh, could someone get out of this jam through using the tools of the presidency? Of course they could. But, but the question is, the germane question is, could he, can he? Yeah, I, it's a fascinating question. It, it really is. And um, I, I have the luxury of, of being now with three people, all of whom have probably provided cons consultation and advice to candidates of one kind or another in debates. So I want to ask you a question. It's a does it matter question. And I thought about it a lot. Um, I'm old enough, of course, to remember uh, when... Um, in the 76 Carter Ford debate, when the New York Times reporter asked Jerry Ford whether or not Eastern Europe was under Soviet domination and the president, I understand what he was trying to do, but he said at least three times that Eastern Bloc states were not under Soviet 
domination. So my question is a very narrow tactical one focused on the debate. Is there any stumble, bumble, or tumble that could actually change foreign policy or otherwise, that could actually change voter perceptions to create a serious Jerry Ford moment? I mean, I think Ford lost the presidency because of the pardon of Nixon, but clearly that statement in the second debate did not help him. So, but are we beyond the point where anything that is said is going to matter, at least by the president? Oh, I think the stakes are definitely high. I mean, if you look at what the Trump campaign is doing, they've been laying the foundation for Joe Biden to get caught making a mistake. Uh, they were shocked by the fact that he performed so well at the convention, but they're still betting that he's going to have kind of a senior moment, right? Because Joe Biden does have those. And so if he, if Joe Biden is asked a question and it kind of blanks out, even if he just takes a second to think and respond, how is that going to play into the existing narrative that may be unfair, but will be repeated ad nauseum throughout the internet. Now, when it comes to Donald Trump, I, I think he has the risk of going too hard at Joe Biden on the family issues. Um, clearly that's something that Donald Trump wants to do. I mean, throughout the 2016 Republican primary, he kind of made a name for himself going after the family members of his Republican opponents, starting with Jeb Bush's wife, Ted Cruz's wife, et cetera. That's kind of his thing to do the thing that is so beyond the norm that other people are too shocked to think he'll actually do it. I'm almost somewhat afraid that it's not going to be the Hunter Biden that will be the target in this debate. It'll be Bo Biden because he wants to go for that emotional, you know, knife into Joe Biden's heart and make him cry, right? Like that would have even if people thought it was unfair people would say wow you know joe biden couldn't really handy that handle that or they might look at donald trump and say wow we are so familiar with this family story and the love that biden has for his family we can't believe you would do that that was an ugly moment so that's those are the really like out of bounds moments i could see moving things in an emotional way for voters right those are two vulnerabilities one for each candidate jen or charlie any other thoughts on this Well, I was just going to throw in, though, that we're talking about 60 years of debates in modern history, modern political history, and arguably only two of them had any importance, really, in terms of 1960 Kennedy-Nixon and 1976, the second debate with Jerry Ford. Right. And and arguably, as you pointed out, the uh, uh, Aaron, that, that uh, uh, the, the pardon probably got into there a little bit. The economy was in, had been in awful shape. And so there were lots of moving parts in that election beyond that. But I, this is being very generous to say that it was really just those two and that that's what sunk President Trump but or pre, pre, President Ford. But um, I just think that because this is that, that Biden would have to pretty massively screw up in a debate for it for an election that's not really about him mm. to turn to change the trajectory of a race that's not very close at this moment and has very few undecideds. Right. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I think Biden has to get like a B minus, even a C plus. I mean, and, you know, it's clear what the strategy is, as Amanda said, of the Trump team, right? They are waiting for Biden to have a moment where he doesn't finish an answer, where he leaves too much time, where he says a name inaccurately, and I'm sure they will push that through their social media massive, you know, apparatus. Um, but, you know, at the same time, Joe Biden, I watched all the Democratic debates in the primary. Those were not his high moments. Um, and he still won the primary, right? Yeah. So sometimes, well, we're all sitting here eating popcorn and watching in our homes at night, which I may, I will be doing this evening, um, as all of us will be doing, because, you know, we're political animals of different stripes, but um, it may not be what people are digesting, right, or what matters to them in the same way, and I think we saw that through the primary. I will say, uh, and not just because I'm a Democrat, but Look, the reason Trump and his team have an aggressive strategy is because they need to change the dynamic in this race, right? Um, and even though there's plus 30 plus days left, 
it's not the same as it has been in the past where everybody's out doing five or six events and people are doing toppers with hits on candidates and their opponents as it has been in the past. And he needs like a different narrative here to make it not about COVID or a referendum on him. The Supreme Court fight is certainly good for him. I'm sure that will come up a million times. Um, but from his, his end, I would I would predict. Um, but, you know, there's there's some pressure on him, too. And that's why I think we're going to see some pretty aggressive tactics um, from his end. I would be surprised if we didn't. Yeah. We have a question from John Rash from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Uh, I think uh, Charlie touched on it. Do voters care about America's standing in the world? And what are the risks and benefits of Biden emphasizing our global standing in the remainder of the campaign? I mean, isn't an inside beltway or outside the beltway answer to this? And I'm very much reminded, even though I go to Maine partly in the summers, my own head is very much stuck on you know, tethered <laughs> to your belly and your heart. Chevy Chase circle. So I gotta, I mean, I have to be very careful. In not there are that. Americans who care about that, but they're also the Americans that watch the PBS News Hour in the evening and they read The Economist and, you know, they're, they're reading two or three newspapers a day. And, you know, it's a pretty elite group. But for the average person out there, um, no, I don't, I don't think that matters so much. It's the, it's their job to get along with us, not our job to get along with them. I mean, it, that would be the mentality with a lot of people, which, you know, is horrifying. But I, I can't say it's it's entirely wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, there's got to be a balance and there ought to be reciprocity. Amanda, any thoughts on uh, America's image as a resonant issue? Well, I think the easier way to talk about this with voters is that does America need friends in the world? Does that benefit America when we have friends who we can rely on in times of need? I think there was a, a big lost opportunity to talk about the importance of organizations like the World Health Organization, which is shocking how easy Trump was able to walk away from that and demonize that organization when you know, we should have been able to explain this is why we need to strengthen our relationships so that we, when something bad like the pandemic happens, we can quickly go into action and have scientists who are on the ground everywhere in the world so we can share information. I mean, the fact that other countries got testing, reliable testing from private labs in places like Germany way much faster than our own CDC, which is so well funded and so well staffed, somehow that mismatch, I mean, that should have been a conversation with voters. How come these smaller countries were able to do it so quickly and we weren't able to copy that information and deploy it here? That's what friends and standing in the world gets you. It gets you results. And when I talk to you know, Republicans who have been working inside the administration, they're very worried that Donald Trump in a second term absolutely will walk away from NATO. This is something that he has been talking about doing here or there. Republicans have been trying to push back, but given a second term where he is free to do whatever he likes with no accountability to voters, I would expect him to eagerly walk away from more organizations which were enacted to help Americans and keep Americans safe. Um, there are some academics who argue that foreign policy, while not substantively of much interest to voters, describe foreign policy as a gateway issue. That is to say, through a commander in chief's poise, prudence, dignity, knowledge, competency, toughness, that this is somehow important. So, it, I mean, it, again, it's another backdoor to the foreign policy question. But is that likely to matter? Getting I think a lot of times you could have something that is technically speaking an issue, but it's not being used as an issue. It's more of a means to an end. Right. And and I mean, take China, for example. A lot of times I'll be talking to people from the Pacific Basin who will say, well, is China an issue in this campaign? And I will ask, well, wait a minute, which, which, which is the pro-China and which is the anti-China candidate in this race? I would argue that China, it's more like a cudgel that each side is using to beat the daylights out of the other one. It's a weapon. It's not an issue that's being you know, debated in any, any serious way. It's a way to inflict harm on the other one because each one has some at least theoretical uh, exposure 
uh, whether it's fair or not, uh, on that. And they want to draw blood from the other and keep it on the other end of the field from them. I mean, I guess it gets to the cuts to the core issue. What does leadership mean to large segments of the American public? What does it mean to, I mean, the president is the national repository still of our greatest hopes, aspirations. I mean, we're fixated and obsessed with this, with who the president marries, the dogs they have. I mean, it's a 24 <laughs> seven job. They eat. Exactly, we can't get enough of them. So the yeah, obverse yeah. side, even, even with Trump the disruptor, is there a downside that accompanies that, I, I would argue perhaps among independents, certainly among Democrats, that's the case. But I mean, I, I'd hate to put that in, it doesn't matter big, because yeah, we're talking up a lot of issues that don't seem to matter. Well, I think as Charlie said, people may not say, I'm voting on Donald Trump's national security qualifications or, or for or against it, right? But there is a line of questioning that you hear among focus groups or when independents are interviewed or people who may have been Trump voters um, in 16, but maybe reconsidering, where they question whether he's up for the job, right? Whether he's up to the task, right? right. And that's not them saying, sometimes they're saying, I wish I didn't vote for him. But sometimes they're not even criticizing him personally, which is where Democrats sometimes need to be a little careful because it's not as effective as people think it is. But it is questioning, look, the guy had a chance. Should we give him four more? He doesn't appear to be up for the job. And I think we, I, that was in part of the messaging from uh, Joe Biden's uh, uh, speech. It was part of Barack Obama's speech. It was part of Michelle Obama's speech. And I think that's a way that you could see Joe Biden, just to go back to the debate, try to get under Donald Trump's skin tonight. Yeah. I will say that writ large, the question of um, you know, foreign policy and how you engage in it, is always, uh, especially when you have an incumbent running, less so for Joe Biden because he was on the Foreign Relations Committee and like has been working in foreign policy for four, 50 years. But when Barack Obama was running, we went on this foreign trip, was was insane. I was on it, if, you were, if anybody remembers this. I mean, we had like no real, I mean, we had a couple of people with us who were of course longtime experts, but you know, we did that to kind of jump over what people often shorthand as the commander in chief test, right? Is this a person you can see being not just the president of the United States and the leader of the party, the leader of the country, but navigating foreign leaders and navigating thorny national security issues. Um, and that is a hurdle that historically some people have to overcome. You know, another way of saying what Jen's saying is it's like you look on a dining room table and you see you see a cake and you just see a cake now. But there are lots of ingredients in that cake that right. made that cake. And it's whether you want to renew a contract for another four years or not, or is this person up to the job or not? There are lots of things that go into that that are that are important and you can't leave out, but you can't throw everything in. I mean, I think that's one of the, the, the challenges for Democrats is there's so many things that you could attack President Trump on. You can't. Yeah. You know, in high school debate, sometimes you do spreads where you would give them a million attacks and there's no way they could answer. But that generally didn't work that well. And you got to focus on what's important and and you got to let the other ones go by. Yeah. Justin Vogt um, asks on YouTube. And it's fascinating. I haven't seen any polling on this, but I'm sure you all have thoughts. Do, do American voters care about foreign intervention into our electoral process and tempering, tampering with our institutions? Is there any data on that, Charlie? Well, um, I, I think they, they care some about when their, a lot of their tax dollars are going on things um, you know, wars that don't seem to be going well or uh, or things that they would like to see have more spending on that are going to something else. But right. it, it gets down to uh, um, it, it gets down to, to casualties. And you know, over my that shoulder is our son who served in the 82nd Airborne in Afghanistan. Um, you can bet we were paying attention. We were I mean, it was it was really important. 
And and that was during Jen while it was while you were in the, in the White House and we were watching that like a hawk back in 2012. Mm -hmm. But that's what people really care about. So to the extent that, that intervention costs lives or maims Americans or or displaces money, sucks up money that could be used for things that people really would like to get. That's important. But just on a another level, not, you know, not I don't think it's that much. Yeah. Amanda, Jen, any thoughts? Yeah, I guess I was reading that question more as like foreign interference in the election. And right. on that oh, I'm sorry. More of, no, no, it's more of an issue to voters. And I think it's because A, uh, the Trump universe did a such a masterful job of convincing people that it wasn't real until the Mueller report, you know, came out years later and looked and charged the Russians who did interfere in the election. But more broadly, it didn't relate down to them. Why did this interference matter to you? So what What happened with the Trump campaign? That happened, he still won. And there hasn't been a good civic in education on how when these actors tamper with the elections, it really impacts their ability to vote. And when I've talked about this with just other, you know, regular Republican conservatives who didn't understand this, what I would say to them is that, listen, when they were interfering in the election through their social media campaigns, they were impersonating you. They were mocking Christian Second Amendment supporting voters in giving this aura of support to Trump that may or may not have existed. It, but they were impersonating your democratic your demographic profile to do that. And I just think that's something we're thinking about when talking about why that kind of intervention does matter because I, it is a low form of identity theft in my mind. Yeah. Okay, we have a few minutes left. I have two questions. We can do. We can dispense with them quickly, unless you want to add something to them. A one round. One, que well, <laughs> one question looks backward, and the other one looks forward. We'll, we'll save the forward one for last. Um, it's now going to be October very soon. Does did will impeachment factor in any way, shape, or form? into this, into voter preferences, attitudes, or has it basically gone the way of the dodo? Okay. Um, Any, any, I, I, the dodo. I yeah. think the Democrats <laughs> are very lucky that, that people have largely moved on and forgot about it. And, you know, we're not talking about the merits. We're talking about something that was going to put the country through a whole lot that never had the slightest chance in the world of being successful. And um, so they've moved on. But it, it, it's kind of like uh, when you had the Democrats, uh, Democrats opposed the first Iraq war and it was hugely successful. And it looked like, wow, that may have been a big mistake. Uh, but then other things happen and moved on. And so they got a they got a pass for having been on the wrong side. Um, and I think Democrats are pretty much getting a pass on impeachment, even though I thought that, you know, from their standpoint, I would have thought that anything that distracted from trying to win an election in November of 2020, uh, and certainly impeachment would fit there, uh, was, was less than prudent. But Yeah, I will say when I've looked at Republican polling, when things really started to get away from Trump wasn't after impeachment in February. It was the combination of the pandemic setting in that he wasn't taking seriously, the protests that were waking, breaking out in the aftermath of George Floyd and his reaction to that. And then also the fact that the Democrats did not uh, nominate so, you know, Bernie Sanders, as many Republicans feared, but instead uh, selected Joe Biden, who is perceived as a more moderate alternative to Donald Trump. And so those three things really gave people permission to start looking beyond Trump um, from what I've seen. And, and add one more to that list, the loss of the economic tailwind. Yep. I mean, that was the most compelling argument to reelect him. And unlike what you would expect, there is no headwind, economic headwind, but it's the loss of the tailwind, the loss of the most compelling argument he had that, that could be made for him. I would add that to Amanda's list, but it's a great list. All right, and finally, I watched Wag the Dog the other night. I'll weigh in, I'll give you my answer first. I know there are 40 days left before an election. I find it 
hard to imagine that a president who's preternaturally risk averse when it comes to the use of military force would in an effort to create another surprise. I just don't understand how it would play or help, or help him. Um, push, provoke, most likely uh, in, in the US-Iranian theater, some, some sort of incident. I say no. What do the, what do the three of you say, or any other October surprises that would that would create a sense of real res risk readiness? Amanda. Well, I, I don't think the October surprise will happen in foreign policy because it happened in September with the um, unexpected death of RBG, and now we're going to Supreme Court confirmations, and so that that's essentially his new VP for the next month. That's where the attention will be that was the unexpected factor that came into the play at the last minute. Right. I agree with that. Um, yeah. I also though think that nobody should underestimate how Democrats have become a little bit more passionate about the issue of the Supreme Court and the control of the Supreme Court than they were in 2016 and 2012. And I've seen it, I think it could be a motivating issue for people who may not even be super jazzed about Joe Biden, but are concerned about the future of the Supreme Court. I will say that in the October surprise category, and we've already seen hints of this, rushing out a vaccine before it's ready um, and trying to push that out on the marketplace. Um, that's the place where I would yeah. be watching and is alarming hugely to me and should be to many people. I think the October surprise uh, would have been better if it were in September, given how many people uh, will be voting really early. And so if it's yeah. an October surprise, it will be awfully futile unless it's in really early October because uh, otherwise it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, oh, well, so what? All right. I want to thank you. I mean, it's been accessible. It's authoritative commentary. It, you guys are terrific, truly. Uh, on behalf of everybody who's listening, let me thank Amanda, Charlie, and Jen. And, uh, well, we'll see you figuratively tonight, I suspect, as we'll scores of millions of Americans. Uh, and stay tuned for the we'll next Carnegie Connects. For sure. Stay tuned to the next for the next Carnegie Connects. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Aaron and Charlie and Amanda.